Good evening. Tonight I'm going to be reading chapter 12 of The Christian Archetype, a Jungian commentary on the life of Christ by Edward F. Edinger. It begins with a quote from C.G. Jung. I only know, and here I am expressing what countless other people know, that the present is a time of God's death and disappearance. The myth says he was not to be found where his body was laid. Body means the outward, visible form, the erstwhile but ephemeral setting for the highest value. The myth further says that the value rose again in a miraculous manner, transformed. It looks like a miracle for when a value disappears, it always seems to be lost irretrievably. So it is quite unexpected that it should come back. The three days descent into hell during death describes the sinking of the vanished value into the unconscious, where, by conquering the power of darkness, it establishes a new order, and then rises up to heaven again, that is, attains supreme clarity of consciousness. The fact that only a few people see the Risen One means that no small difficulties stand in the way of finding and recognizing the transformed value. That's from Psychology and Religion, Collected Works, 11, paragraph 149. Scripture reads, Resurrection. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulchre, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Luke 24, 1 through 6. After the discovery of the empty tomb, there are several accounts of encounter with the risen Christ. Mary Magdalene is the first to meet him, but mistakes him for the gardener. John 20, 11 through 17. He appeared to the eleven disciples on a mountain in Galilee, but some doubted, Matthew 28, 16, and 17. Two disciples meet him on the road to Emmaus, but their eyes were holden that they should not know him, Luke 24, 13 to 16. He appeared again to the eleven in Luke 24, 36 and following. But they were terrified and affrighted, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And finally he appeared to the disciples fishing in the Sea of Tiberias. Quote, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. John 21, 4. The fact that the risen Christ is not recognized at first, even by his intimate companions, means that no small difficulties stand in the way of finding and recognizing the transformed value. These difficulties concern the transition from Christ to the Holy Ghost, that is, the transition from commitment to a concrete external value to the inner autonomous psyche. Christ's resurrection has its parallel in the reconstitution of the dismembered body of Osiris by Isis. There's a footnote. To record a piece of synchronicity, on June 3, 1981, while writing this word in the original draft, the word is dismembered, I was interrupted by a telephone call which informed me of the death of my son, Ronald, a young man fated to live out this archetype. I'll read the sentence again. The word is dismembered. Christ's resurrection has its parallel in the reconstitution of the dismembered body of Osiris by Isis. This was accomplished by anointing it, thus inaugurating the Egyptian embalming process, which transforms the deceased into an immortal body, 
This process takes 40 days, Genesis 50, 3. 40 is a prefiguration of the alchemical opus and corresponds to the length of time between Christ's resurrection and ascension. The death and rebirth of Christ and Osiris correspond to the death and rebirth sequence in the individuation process. Following the mortificatio, negredo, comes the dawn of the reborn son, rubedo. This archetypal event is mirrored externally by the death and rebirth of the vegetation spirit each winter and spring. Out of blackness comes the green, Jung writes, quote, the state of imperfect transformation, merely hoped for and waited for, does not seem to be one of torment only, but of positive, if hidden, happiness. It is the state of someone who, in his wanderings among the mazes of his psychic transformation, comes upon a secret happiness, which reconciles him to his apparent loneliness. In communing with himself, he finds not deadly boredom and melancholy, but an inner partner. More than that, a relationship that seems like the happiness of a secret love, or like a hidden springtime, when the green seed sprouts from the barren earth, holding out the promise of future harvests. It is the alchemical Benedicta Veritatis, the blessed greenness, signifying on the one hand the leprosy of the metals, verdigris, but on the other the secret imminence of the divine spirit of life in all things. In the remarkable 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul gives us a description of the resurrection archetype. Quote, Someone may ask, how are dead people raised, and what sort of body do they have when they come back? They are stupid questions. Whatever you sow in the ground has to die before it is given new life, and the thing you sow is not what it is going to come, and the thing that you sow is not what is going to come. You sow a bare grain, say of wheat or something like that, and then God gives it the sort of body that it has chosen. Each sort of seed gets its own sort of body. Everything that is flesh is not the same flesh. There is human flesh, animal's flesh, the flesh of birds and the flesh of fish. Then there are heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies. But the heavenly bodies have a beauty of their own and the earthly bodies a different one. The sun has its brightness, the moon a different brightness, and the stars a different brightness, and the stars differ from each other in brightness. It is the same with the resurrection of the dead. The thing that is sown is perishable, but what is raised is imperishable. The thing that is sown is contemptible, but what is raised is glorious. The thing that is sown is weak, but what is raised is powerful. When it is sown, it embodies the soul. When it is raised, it embodies the spirit. If the soul has its own embodiment, so does the spirit have its own embodiment. The first man, Adam, as scripture says, became a living soul, but the last Adam has become a life-giving spirit. That is, first the one with the soul, not the spirit, and after that, the one with the spirit. The first man, being from the earth, is earthly by nature. The second man is from heaven. As this earthly man was, so are we on earth. And as heavenly man is, so are we in heaven. And we, who have been modeled on the earthly man, will be modeled on the heavenly man. Or else, brothers, put it this way, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, and the perishable cannot inherit what lasts forever. I will tell you something that has been secret, that we are not all going to die but we shall all be changed. This will be instantaneous. In the twinkling of an eye, when the last trumpet sounds, it will sound and the dead will be raised, imperishable, and we shall be changed as well, because our present perishable nature must put on imperishability, and this mortal nature 
must put on immortality versus 35 to 53, the Jerusalem Bible, unquote. Jung states the same idea in modern terms, quote, the utter failure came at the crucifixion in tragic words, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? If you want to understand the full tragedy of those words, you must realize what they meant. Christ saw that his whole life, devoted to the truth according to his best conviction, had been a terrible illusion. He had lived it to the full, absolutely sincerely. He had made his honest experiment, but it was nevertheless a compensation. On the cross, his mission deserted him. But because he had lived so fully and devotedly, he won through to the resurrection body, unquote. That was from C.G. Jung speaking, pages 97 and following. Jung's resurrection body corresponds to Paul's celestial body, 1 Corinthians 15.4. What they refer to is beyond our conscious grasp. My own hypothesis is that they refer to the ultimate goal of individuation, the transformation of ego into archetype. The footnote is a reference to Edinger's The Creation of Consciousness, pages 23 and following, all of which has been read on this channel. The death and resurrection of Christ is an archetype which lives itself out, not only in the individual, but also in the collective psyche. There are certain periods in history when the collective God image undergoes death and rebirth. Such is now the case. The 20th century is the holy Saturday of history. Quote, when Nietzsche said God is dead, he uttered a truth which is valid for the greater part of Europe. People were influenced by it, not because he said so, but because it stated a widespread psychological fact. The consequences were not long delayed. After the fog of isms, the catastrophe. That's from Psychology and Religion, Collected Works 11, paragraph 145. We are living in what the Greeks called the kairos, the right moment, for a metamorphosis of the gods, of the fundamental principles and symbols. This peculiarity of our time is the expression of the unconscious man within us who is changing. And now scripture on the ascension. The resurrection is actually the first term in a threefold sequence, resurrection, ascent, descent, Pentecost. The ascension is described in Acts 1, 8 through 11. Jesus says to his disciples, quote, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Sumeria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Figure 27. And figure 27 is the ascension by Rembrandt. The last remark is usually understood to refer to the parousia, the second coming of Christ. However, it could equally well refer to the coming of the Holy Ghost at Pentecost, especially since Christ is speaking of the Holy Ghost coming at the beginning of the passage. Christ is God-man and therefore carrier of a paradox. Considered as God, he originated in heaven, descended to earth in his incarnation, and returned to heaven in the ascension. However, considered as man, he originated on earth, ascended to heaven, and returned to earth as the Holy Ghost, or paraclete. 
The latter sequence of ascent followed by descent corresponds to alchemical symbolism. The Emerald Tablet of Hermes, a recipe for creating the Philosopher's Stone, includes these words, quote, it ascends from the earth to the heaven and descends again to the earth and receives the power of the above and below. Unquote. Commenting on this passage, Jung writes, quote, For the alchemist, it is not a question of a one-way ascent to heaven, but in contrast to the route followed by the Christian Redeemer, who comes from above to below, and from there returns to the above, the Phileus Macrocosmi starts from below, ascends on high, and with the powers of the above and below, united in himself, returns to earth again. He carries out the reverse movement and thereby manifests a nature contrary to that of Christ and the Gnostic redeemers." Unquote. The question, does the redeemer originate on earth or heaven, suggests the psychological question, does individuation originate from the ego or the self? This confronts us with the ego-self paradox. Quote, the self, like the unconscious, is an a priori existent out of which the ego evolves. It is, so to speak, an unconscious prefiguration of the ego. It is not I who create myself, rather I happen to myself. However, psychology must reckon with the fact that despite the causal nexus, man does enjoy a feeling of freedom, which is identical with autonomy of consciousness. The existence of eco-consciousness has meaning only if it is free and autonomous. By stating these facts, we have, it is true, established an antinomy, but we have at the same time given a picture of things as they are. In reality, both are always present the supremacy of the self, and the hybris of consciousness. There's a footnote from Jung's essay, Transformation, Symbolism, and the Mass, Psychology and Religion, Collected Works 11, paragraph 391. Quote, if eco-consciousness follows its own road exclusively, it is trying to become like a god or a superman. But exclusive recognition of its dependence only leads to a childish fatalism and misanthropic spiritual arrogance. The same essay in The Mysteries, papers from the Eranos yearbooks, adds these sentences, quote, If ego consciousness follows its own road exclusively, it is trying to become like a god or a superman. But exclusive recognition of its dependence only leads to a childish fatalism and to a world-negating and misanthropic spiritual arrogance, page 324. That's the end of chapter 12. We have two more chapters to read.